In the headlines, major changes to the Concorde experience which is being repurposed. Barbados appeals to Saudi Arabia to see the Caribbean as an investment attractive region. Trinidad and Tobago officials visit the Oysters Bay Garden as they seek to replicate the fish fry experience in their home country. And in sports, St. Gabriel's are the 2023 primary school swim champions. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. Good evening with the CBC News Night. I'm Wendy Burke. More than a million dollars is being invested in the Concord experience to transform it into a terminal to accommodate primarily air to sea passengers. That's according to officials at the Grant Lee Adams International Airport, who add the original idea of the facility being a premier tourist attraction has not been abandoned. May hear more in this Crystal White report. It was 20 years ago today, on November 17, 2003, that British Airways Concorde aircraft, GBOAE, made its final flight from London Heathrow Airport to Grantley Adams International Airport here in Barbados, on loan to the people of Barbados in recognition of the island's role in the brand's success. This distinctive supersonic aircraft became the centerpiece of the Concorde experience, opened in 2007 as a premier tourist attraction. The high-tech facility included a flight simulation, a museum on the history of aviation and the Concorde, and it was also often used as an event location. However, the Concorde experience was officially closed in 2018. Now it is being repurposed in the short term before being returned to an attraction in the medium to long term. Chief Executive Officer of the Grantley Adams International Airport, Hadley Bourne, explains. The immediate goal is to have the facility uh, fitted out with all of the various security equipment and other protocols with airports to manage between six and 700 passengers, the air to sea passengers. Perhaps one of the primary questions Barbadians will ask is if at any point it will revert to a tourist attraction where they too can have access to it. Our main immediate goal is to deal with the air to sea numbers for this winter season, but it's all intention to have the Concorde back as a tourist attraction, as, as a museum piece. I know in the aviation and other social media uh, circles, they're saying that it's here and it's dilapidated and it's falling apart. And as you can see, that is still in its glory. He also talks about the time frame for implementation. Timeline is late December. We've had some logistical challenges in terms of the shipping. Yesterday we got delivery of the security equipment and they'll be installed shortly. Then we'll bring everything up to speed, make sure it meets all the regulatory requirements with all the various agencies, have a couple of test runs, but we're hoping to have it up and running by late December. My final question is as relates to costs. I know back in 2018, the then Minister of Tourism, Kerry Simmons, said it would require a $1 million injection. You're reopening now, not as a museum, but as a cruise terminal. How much did this cost? It was a significant capital investment um, that the airport would have made to bring this back into operations. It, I think at the time when Minister Simmons would have made that announcement, I think the main challenge here was at the time the ACs, we were completely replacing the ACs, but our additional aviation security equipment and aviation seats and other amenities, I will say the cost is, will be, it is more than one million for sure. Mr. Bourne shared that British Airways has also given Barbados its blessing for the plans outlined. Crystal Hoyt, CBC News. Barbados and the government of Saudi Arabia have finalized an air services agreement. The deal was signed today by Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade Kerry Simmons, while Minister of Transport and Logistics Services Saleh bin Nassar Al Jasser signed on behalf of Saudi Arabia. The process for finalizing the agreement began last year when Minister of Tourism and International Transport Ian Gooding Edgel, along with Saudi Arabia's Minister of Tourism Ahmed Al Khatib, initialed the draft agreement.
Finalizing the accord is seen as a step towards enhancing relations between the two countries and provides an opportunity for Barbados to expand its global reach. It will also assist the island in developing an international aviation system. Barbados and Saudi Arabia established diplomatic ties on December 17, 2007. In related news, Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley has asked Saudi officials to consider investing in non-traditional areas in the Caribbean, such as health, education and the ocean. Her call came as she and other CARICOM heads of government participated in a roundtable meeting at the King Abdul Aziz International Conference Center in Riyadh. The inaugural Saudi Arabia CARICOM Summit is being held under the distinguished patronage of His Royal Highness the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. During the summit, which ends today, Prime Minister Motley also held talks with the Saudi Ministers of Finance and Investment to follow up on a number of discussions already in progress. The unique experience created by the fish fry at the Oysters Bay Garden has captured the attention of Trinidad and Tobago officials. So much so that 11 members of the Kuva Tabaqui Talpara Regional Corporation are in Barbados for a first-hand experience and to learn as much as they can about it. They toured the facility this morning and are expected to visit the venue tonight for the full festivities. However, beyond the Friday night vibe, Chairman Ryan Rampasad believes there are other areas to be explored. Apart from looking at the, the, the Oysters Fish Festival model and looking to implement that fish fry um, um, area within Kuva, our main town, we are looking at sport tourism also and, um, and any other area of interest that our region can benefit from. We, this team here, we are very much um, you know, interested, we are open to it. And government MP Trevor Prescott, who has been integral in making the trip a reality, is upbeat partnerships could be formed with local non-governmental organizations. We hope that before we leave, we will fully establish is some memorandum of understanding between the Habitat Lashley Foundation, the Israel Level Foundation, and the local body. Because this is a form of development that is coming from the ground. In other words, we, 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 are, not, we are not rejecting the top-down approach, yeah. but this is coming from the ground. Coming up, the Minister with Responsibility for Crime Prevention encourages some youngsters to choose the peaceful path. Choose peace over violence. That was the message to students of the Blackman and Gollop Primary School from the minister in the office of the Attorney General with Responsibility for Crime Prevention, Corey Lane. It came as part of the rollout of the National Peace Program and the Tyree Caesar Foundation's Against Gun Violence Initiative for schools across Barbados. Trevor Thorpe reports. The Crime Prevention Minister told the students they are peace ambassadors and asked them to set goals. He said the initiative will help them to choose peace over violence. There are too many people in our society today, whether we look in our home communities, whether we look in our schools, look in this country or across the world, that choose war over peace. And what does it bring but pain and mayhem, destruction, death, depression, sadness. But peace brings to you joy prosperity and a good feeling. Coordinator for the school's peace program, Rhonda Brian Hudson told the students the school was chosen because Terry Caesar attended the institution and officials believe they can help make a difference. The message we're promoting today is peace. We're promoting anti-violence because we want a better tomorrow and we want a better society and a better world for you. So together we can do it, together we will deliver on that message. Principal Harriet Blackman said the students will receive a peace booklet to help guide them as they participate in the initiative. We're going to take that message across. We want to make sure that everybody understands and we want to take this into practice, not just have it today, but teach children because we have to teach children, teach children how to pause, what it means to pause, what it means to stop, take a breath, to go through all this, make good choices. So we're going to share that throughout the school and ensure that that message is taken. So it's not going to end today. We're going to ensure that it's done throughout. The National Peace Program and the Therese Caesars Foundation Against Gun Violence Initiative will touch all schools in Barbados. 
Trevor Thorpe, CBC News. Questions have been raised about what will happen to students who are attending a school proposed to become a senior academy when the tiered system for education begins. During the latest consultation meeting on the school's transformation initiative, Curtis Luke of the Barbados Secondary Teachers Union sought to provide some answers. In 2025, if the child is at a school that is to become a senior college of excellence, they will transfer over to a school that will be a junior college of excellence. Um, there's no getting around that. What we tried to think about in the proposals was built, was built in flexibility. So looking at an appellate system, um, going from primary school to secondary school, also looking at that same type of appellate system in terms of which of the junior academies would be most comfortable for the child to be assigned to. It was also queried whether or not single-sex secondary schools would remain. Education consultant Dr. Ida May Denny replied in the affirmative. The proposals recognize that parents and some teachers want to have single-sex schools. So having listened to all of those consultations that we had, we did put in a recommendation for keeping the two single-sex schools that we now have. The issue of media talent and outstanding talent selection and development has been raised in the context of artificial intelligence. Veteran broadcaster Julian Rogers delivered the 7th UWI 60th Anniversary Legacy Lecture last night, focused on the evolution of media in, Caribbean and the Car in Barbados and the Caribbean. Speaking on the theme, Ready Fusion to AI, Mr. Rogers spoke about how technology could create some difficulties where the creation of broadcasting excellence is concerned. Where will the next Marvel Manning come from? Where will the next outstanding anchors and producers and whatever else across this entire Caribbean come from? In an age where you could have somebody reading the news who is not even a human being. That is, a, that is, that is an Indian anchor. She reading the news left, right and center. And it is also possible in terms of radio, radio news. I could sit right here and give you a newscast in less than three minutes based on the newspaper that the nation put out today and have it timed, by the way, to happen at 11 minutes after the hour, every hour for the next God knows how long. Dr. Tara Innes, Senior Lecturer in History, says the world is at an important juncture in the information age. At one time, technology offered a lot of promise for wider distribution of the news and events shaping our world. Now, in the age of social media, we are battling the onslaught of misinformation and disinformation, which are being used to manipulate minds and sway opinions, and worse yet, actually influence our behaviors and actions in negative ways. The Ministry of Health and Wellness has advised COVID-19 dashboard statistics will now be issued every four weeks instead of fortnightly. Explaining the rationale behind the move, Chief Medical Officer, the Most Honorable Dr. Kenneth George, said in recent times transmission levels have remained consistently low. He adds that there are no current hospitalizations and circulating strains are less virulent. Dr. George is, however, reminding the public that COVID-19 is an infectious disease and could still re result in severe outcomes. He is therefore urging people to practice good respiratory and hand hygiene. A plea has been made for men feeling a sense of hopelessness to seek help. It comes from founder and president of the Men's Empowerment Network Support, Fabian Sargent. According to him, there has been a high demand for his organization to provide counseling services as a lot of people are not coping well. There's a sense of hopelessness among a lot of men and they don't know how to really cope. And what I really um, appreciate, uh, I should say that I like, is that they are reaching out. We do find men that are reaching out and that is what is necessary. If you understand that there's a challenge, if you feel as if you are feeling different, um, things are not going the way mentally, 
reach out, you know, and men, a lot of men have been reaching out. I must say that we've been providing that opportunity for men to reach out. And, and if we don't have the resources to handle or we usually refer, you know, our men empowerment network, that word network in here is very critical because we have to work with other organizations. Mr. Sargent was a guest on CBC TV 8's Morning Barbados ahead of International Men's Day to be observed on Sunday. He wants people to use the day to really celebrate men. Even on the international level, they speak about um, you're celebrating men, but you're focusing on the issues. <clears throat> we traditionally have an issue with how we celebrate men. If you're going to celebrate men, the successes, the values that we bring to families, societies, let us do that. So that is what we are doing um, as an organization for this weekend, um, along with other groups, because there are other organizations who are also celebrating men and our successes and everything that we do at the family level and community level. Time now to join Anne-Marie Burke in the Sports Center. Good evening to you, Wendy. Good evening to everyone. We begin with news of swimming. Four records fell as St. Gabriel School won the 2023 Purity Primary Interschool Swimming Championships today at the Aquatic Center in Wildey. Aaliyah Graves of Trinity Academy erased her all record of 16.69 seconds in the 11 to 12 girls backstroke to finish with a new time of 16.64. The other two were in the relays where St. Gabriel set a new time of 1 minute 03.59 seconds in the the mix open 4 by 25 meter relay and they also set a new mark of 1 minute 03.78 seconds in the boys 4 by 25 meter relay. The other individual record was set by Aaliyah Pilgrim of Warren's Primary in the girls 7 to 8 25 meter breaststroke with a new time of 22.17 seconds erasing the old time of 21.48 set by Faith Jeffrey back in 2018. Overall St. Gabriel's amassed 392 points to be clear cut winner Head of Providence Elementary with 190.5. Warriors was third with 138, as the top five was rounded out by St. Winifred's with 111 and Charles F. Broom 96. Here's a look at the 25 meter breaststroke events. We hit the water first of the babies of the meet, the under six girls. This was the start of the 25 meter breaststroke events. And cast your eyes to the middle of the screen. The pink cap of Maya Gill of the St. Winifreds and the blue of Nailani Kamabach of Providence. Gill made race, taking a glance to the right and the left, sizing up her competition. Before picking up the pace to take the lead as she pushes to the wall, this race was all hers. As the fight was for a second, and in comes Kamabach's teammate, Ava Richardson. Close to the screen to tip in for a second. The boys race now and they were into the pool quickly. We had a pretty even start into the first few strokes until Judas Sylvester established that he was the one to beat. As soon enough, he had a full body life on his opponents. It was a done deal just to see the time now. He stopped the clock at 34.52 seconds. St. Gabriel's had a champion. Second, Kai Matney of Light Primary School, 36.92. And St. Louis Academy, Ethan Greenwich was third in 39 seconds flat. And this next race was a record swim for Wills Primary's Aaliyah Pilgrim in the girls' 7-8. to eight. She was out like a bullet from early. So much so she left the others way behind. Pilgrim was in a class all her own. And Faith Jeffrey's 2018 record will be no more. Watch as she powered to the wall in the new time of 22.17 seconds. The old time of 22.45 was gone. Coming in for second, Providence's Christina Howell, 26.92. While Pilgrim's teammate, Karis Freeman, was third. Seven to eight boys, you pick it up almost at the halfway stage where the battle was between St. Gabriel's teammates Khalil Patrick and Blake Green. Both boys giving each other a quick glance as they fought to see who would be victorious. And here comes on the outside wheels, Darry Duglin. These final strokes were nail biting as they come to the wall three the hard way and it will be Patrick, Duglin, then Graham. That was a good one. I watch as the 9 to 10 girls emerge out of the water midway stage and still too close to call. One thing's for sure, the middle of the pool was where the action was at. And here she comes in lane number four, Jayla Best of Bailey's primary, first to the wall in 20.62 seconds, ahead of St. Gabriel's pair of Gabriella Bab and Leila Shorey. 
The pace was hot like fur in the boys 9 to 10. Remember these are the 25 meter breaststroke events. And Chris Vanderpool engaged an extra gear just about 15 meters to go. His strokes were sharp but powerful. He was on a mission and gliding through the water to complete it. And that he did. Vanderpool of People's Cathedral in 20.08 seconds ahead of Trinity Academy's Arrow Brathwaite with 21.23 and third Josiah Paris of Charles F. Broom in 21.81. All eyes were on lane four as Aaliyah Graves in the gray swimsuit. Already having broken the record in the backstroke, she was the one to be in this 11 to 12 girls breaststroke sprint. But it wouldn't be an easy one as on her right shoulder was St. Gabriel Shania Corbin. These two were at it, stroke for stroke, but then Graves found that extra edge. Just about five meters left. The wall is fast approaching. Who would it be? Graves of Trinity Academy ahead of Corbin and the other St. Gabriel swimmer, Rain Brown. It. The winning time was 20.27 seconds. And the big boys hit the pool, a full field of eight for this final. And we zoom in on our eventual winner, Adante Martin of Bright Sparks Primary. He's pretty much had it done and dusted with just about 15 meters to go, extending the lead to win in a time of 19.80 seconds. Head of St. Winifred's Axel Whitehead and St. Gabriel's Elijah Telford. That's a wrap on the primary schools. The secondary school swimmers will be in the pool next week. Several entrepreneurs in the local beauty industry are at the heart of an initiative to raise awareness about their products and take them beyond the island shores. It was rolled out today by the Barbados Trust Fund Limited in partnership with Number One Beauty Supplies. Business Development Manager Kurt Dotton told the business report that the plan includes 10 outlets. This initiative came up in the manifest program and we recently completed cohort two. And I want to say that through a number of stakeholders, but particularly our seasoned stakeholders, be um, Export Barbados, and they've been very working with us very close. But the whole program, as it mentions, upscale is manifest manufacturing upscaling program. So the whole idea is to move these businesses from the local market and hand them over to Export Barbados, whereas they can focus on the export potential and try to get some of the businesses in the export market and even through this initiative here we're here at BGA but they also have stores outside of Barbados so there's also the potential once we meet the, the standards that is potential for these businesses to actually get access to the export market stores. The fund's business development officer Jaricia Duran gave details of what's included. It has been really good so far from a client's perspective. They uh, feel a sense of appreciation that, you know, we have helped the brands, you know, with placements within the local market, something that a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with so far. And then in terms of the the persons purchasing, customers purchasing the products, they're really interested in soaps, especially the combinations that they come up with, bay leaf and lemongrass, the skincare. We have chemists on board manufacturing skincare products. So the customers seem to be very interested in the products as well. Company director and owner of Number One Beauty Supplies, Mohamed Yuni, says the initiative is set to bring awareness to local products before getting to the export market. This is our first day, yeah, we're optimistic. As you see, they have nice products, the packaging and everything, and people um, liked it. We give samples and they, so hopefully it's gonna be a good start. And I think it's encouraging, you know, to work with them. And it's time for round two of sports with Anne-Marie. And I start with football news. The Barbados Football Association has announced a 23-member squad for two remaining matches in the CONCACAF Nations League. Several players who were omitted from the previous squad under former coach Orlando da Costa have all returned to the senior men's national team ahead of tonight's home match against Nicaragua and for an aware fixture three days later to Montserrat. Interim head coach and BFA technical director Emerson Boyce named a strong local-based squad with the likes of former captains Hayden Holligan and Rashad Jules, along with excited midfielders Omani Liko and Akil Applewhite returning to the team. Speaking to CBC Sports following a training session at the Wildy Turf, Boy said he's pleased with the mood in the dressing room. The boys are giving me 100%. 
um, have come with the right attitude. Um, we had a lot of conversations about the past and they're very much want to put that behind them and show what they can do and represent Barbados and you know that's um, that's music to my ears and as I say they're committed to the, the cause and they want to put some points on the board and um, they're looking forward to Friday and want a good result. Now, Queen's College continued their winning ways as the Barbados Secondary School's Under-19 Netball League continued. Their latest victims were at the Lodge School. Playing in the pink bibs, the girls from Queen's College traveled to Messiah Street to hand Lodge School a defeat and by halftime held a 10-5 lead and at the start of the third continued to assert their dominance. That was shooter Alyssa Davidson. On the other end, Lodge was playing much better than the first two quarters. The effective overhead passes allowed shooter Ciara White to net this one from long range. The ball is headed back up court, QC in control. The player takes a fall but retains possession, although it looked like a replay to me. And then watch the overhead lob, nicely done. And shooter Davidson again made it a done deal as QC ended the third, still up 17-7. to seven. Final quarter now, Law shooting up court and QC keeping the defense tight, but it was contact called. And so shooter White gets the advantage and makes it count. Back down court, the goals kept coming though. The QC girls in control. And where Abila Clark missed, Davidson backed her up. And the margin of goals kept increasing as the ball was finding the circle and Davidson was converting as she should. Another of her 10 goals of the game. Lodge were fighting to Fanel to stay in it, but QC girls were relentless in their defense. Again, a seal that resulted in a goal. As the girls from Queen's College returned to husbands with the 21-10 to 10 win. Broward County Stadium in Florida is ready to host matches in the ICC Men's T20 World Cup in June 2024, which will mark a historic moment as West Indies and the USA present the largest Cricket World Cup ever. Cricket West Indies President Dr. Kishore Shallow held meetings in Fort Lauderdale this month to discuss the progress and opportunities surrounding the global calendar event. While the primary focus of the discussion centered on the forthcoming ICC Men's T20 World Cup, Parallel considerations of future plans were also tabled. These encompass collaborative efforts to enhance cricket in both the West Indies and the USA. The ICC Men's T20 World Cup 2024 match schedule is expected to be announced in the coming weeks. That's our news. Do enjoy the rest of your evening.